happy to announce uh, our uh, today's activity. So this is a panel discussion, and let me give you a little bit of the history. So as you all know, I uh, hope that there is this week the workshop for equity in mathematics education, which has been taking place in one of the rooms down the corridor. And uh, so this is a, a great event that's been happening at PCMI in one form or another for the past uh, eight years or so. And every year now, the, uh, the uh, leader of the program changes. And so we were extremely uh, fortunate to attract uh, Rochelle Gutierrez, Professor Rochelle Gutierrez from the University of uh, Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, who is a renowned scholar in, in this subject. And she's been leading her group wonderfully this week. And I asked her to lead a panel discussion this was an idea of uh, having such a panel discussion. For the past couple of years, we've been doing this. And this is a great way to share with all of the PCMR participants what the workshop has been doing. So um, joining her on stage are Brian Katz and Marielle Myers. So um, they will. So let me turn it over to them. Wonderful. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. <laughs> OK. Uh, oh, Mike. Uh, uh, so I just wanted to start by acknowledging the land. I mean, as a white settler nation, we are standing here on stolen grounds. We are meeting on stolen grounds. Um, these are the ancestral and unceded territories of the Shoshone, uh, the Paiute, the Goshut, and the Ute ter um, nations. And I pay my respects to those who have struggled to live upon and nurture and save the land upon which we are currently meeting. We started this, we started, we want to have a conversation with you in three parts. Um, the first part is that we want to talk a little bit about why we've made this shift. Why have we shifted from talking about equity to talking about rehumanizing mathematics? Then we want to spend a little bit of time and we'll introduce a framework. Then we want to spend some time talking about what are we doing in these projects when we're in the other room over there, that room that sees the locked door that everyone says we can't seem to really get in. Uh, what is it that we're doing in that room? And then we're going to move to some, um, to some loving challenges and to some uh, suggestions of how uh, we hope we can all move this work forward and uh, answer some questions that maybe are lingering in your mind. So um, we start with the, the fact that um, we've all been grappling with whether or not this word equity really captures the kinds of things that we want to accomplish in our work. And for me, that word equity feels like it's been bogged down in history. It's something that even when we think, even when individually each of us wants to think about how our work is more, more complicated and more sophisticated than what that word typically um, uh, captures, when we're in conversation with other people, because we use that word equity or we use a word diversity or inclusion or any of those other kinds of words um, that are more mainstream, it stops us from being able to have um, dialogue and visioning because we don't, we don't stop in the conversation and say, well, wait a second, what do you, when you say equity, what do you mean by equity? Um, when I say equity, I mean it this way. We just assume that we're talking about the same thing. And we actually really only know we're addressing equity when we're so far away from our target. So in other words, we might as a math department say, wow, the students that are in our math program don't re really represent um, the, the people that are in society or the people even that are at this institution at this university. And so we want to change that. But then as you get closer and closer towards who's actually in your program and how are they supported, maybe not everybody's on board with what's happening as you get closer. So again, it's this idea that we can all agree that we have this far off kind of uh, direction that we want to move to, but we may not all agree on the same destination. And, and also that word equity tends to privilege a kind of universal and a white stream way of viewing things that, uh, that we really care mo mostly about getting opening the door and having more people be part of this practice of mathematics and not that uh, we actually expect mathematics to change. And the way I frame it is I often say, you know, we say that math that people will that people need mathematics in their lives. We say they need it because it will help them be good problem solvers. It will help them um, be engaged citizens and be able to be critical of graphs and other information that they're constantly getting. It will help them uh, get better jobs and be part of STEM pipelines. And we never really ask, well, is this really just a one-way thing? Is there, or is this thing two ways? Maybe it's not just that people need mathematics. Maybe it's that mathematics needs people. And who those people are might ask different questions, might have different purposes for wanting to do mathematics. And so really, you know, kind of coming to this position of, well, maybe we need a new angle. Uh, maybe we need a new angle on this very long-term problem. And maybe that angle is more moral um, and humanistic than it is technical. 
So that's really kind of how we got to doing this work. We'd like to encourage you to think about Oh, so we wanted to make sure this was active before the Q&A, and so uh, we have a Think Pair Share activity for you. Um, so we'd like you to take a minute to think about a specific mathematical experience that felt alienating, marginalizing, or dehumanizing to you or a peer or a student. You're just you're trying to get, generate a concrete example, and we're sort of intentionally asking you to brainstorm before. We give a, a definition, and we, I know this is a very personal thing that we're asking you to think about and then share, so if you'd like to generalize it to this could happen or I could imagine this rather than this did happen to me so that you feel safe talking about it with your partner, that's, that's perfectly fine. So take a couple, of, maybe one minute, oh, quietly. Three. three minutes. Okay, at least one minute quietly, oh, and then oh, at least two minutes yourself. with your partner. <laughs> Go. So one minute to think quietly right now. Talking to your neighbor about your example. I wish I had put it on my change and that's what I'm presenter on because I don't know what the next slides are and I feel oh. like I'm kind of like I'm forgetting where we are in the middle of I didn't get good sleep last night. We're not asking you to write your example on the note card. People are passing out note cards because there's going to be other times when we're asking you to write something down. Or anything, it was just really, and MCTN I was just talking, is like I was all talking about to production, this. And, you know, like, <laughs> I've given lots of talks, and that one that I, is that the only one I could think of is, okay. yeah, it was in some kind of special theater, yeah, yeah, and so it was very, you were even just the stage, how far it was before the first set of seats, yeah, I think it's because normally there's like an orchestra or yeah. something oh, else that's yeah. that space, oh, yeah, so you just felt like you were like so far removed. I didn't set a time. So. It's been two minutes of talking, two minutes of 
here talking. It's good. I mean, there's these pieces. Of okay. Let's let's come back together. So, would, is somebody willing to um, to share what you were talking about? Hello, hello. Testing, testing. Hello. Oh, oh, great. Rochelle, you asked me to take a risk, so I'm going to take a risk right now. This is about the parade. It was a high and a low experience yesterday. The high was the community. Of course, we all love math, and we have that a uh, spirit of camaraderie, and we want to share our love. And as we were walking halfway through, who were we serving? Who were we observing? Who were we seeing? We were seeing the wealthy, and let's just call it out, white community, right? As we were walking down, we were seeing a de the demographics change. My heart hurts. Um, those of you who were maybe walking with me, I was chanting, Viva las Matemáticas. And who did we hear? We heard some of the people clap. Did we have any poster? Did we have anything reflect the demographics of the community that serves the population that lives here for maybe the summer? Are we, are we representing math for all? My heart hurts. Are you guys hearing me? Am I, am I? Mm -hmm. That parade was awesome because we share and reflect our passion for math. But are we sharing and reflecting our passion for the people of Park City? Some, but not all. Is there another person who'd be willing to share what you talked about? Oh, they're gonna take it down. So in my senior year of college, my thesis advisor, um, who I'd come to admire a lot, um, used to jokingly abbreviate finite abelian groups as fags in our thesis work, not knowing that I was a gay guy. And so that kind of that kind of made it hard to like feel like he was on my team. When I was in a differential equations class and I would work with another friend on homework a lot and I got a test back and my score was significantly different than his and we answered very, a question very similarly. So we went to the professor and we showed them both our work and asked what went wrong and he had told me that I had gotten it wrong on a previous homework and that I didn't deserve full credit. Let's just take one more. Yeah. Yeah. One, more. one more down here in the front. So I want to preface this by saying that you know I've I've had about as much mathematical privilege as, as one can have. I've, I grew up in a in a family. Um, you know, my mom's a physicist, my dad's a mathematician, but my dad. Oh, is this, is this working? Okay. Uh, this is, so this is a story about my dad who grew up in a small village in South India. His dad was uh, an English teacher, and when my dad wanted to take some, uh, an extra math class in school, uh, the math teacher said, I don't know why you're bothering. Your older brothers couldn't do math. Your dad can't do math. No one in your house, no one in your family can do math. Why are you bothering? And it wasn't until you know, that 
teacher retired and a new teacher came in that anybody in my dad's family thought that math was something that, that was for them. So that was something that's always st stuck in my head. So we've introduced um, a, a word, rehumanizing mathematics, and we haven't really told you what it is. And we're going to explain a little bit about the framework. Um, but we want to first just start with that idea of like, why rehumanizing? Why are we using this word? Um, and for me, that word re in rehumanizing um, really is, is honoring our history. It's honoring the fact that as humans, we've been doing mathematics um, for centuries, um, and that people continue to do mathematics Thank you, sorry. And that people continue to do mathematics uh, in, um, outside of schools, outside of institutional settings, that people are constantly doing this in everyday ways in life that are not necessarily sanctioned as mathematics. So for me, it's about rehumanizing mathematics because it's not something that we're trying to move to that we don't know or that we have to create, but it's really bringing back that which has been erased by the institution of schooling. I think. All of us know about the kinds of playful things that we did mathematically as kids. And then when you get to school, you're taught you no longer know mathematics unless you can show your work in this way, or unless you produce it with this particular algorithm, or if you stop using your fingers to count, or any one of a number of things. Um, the rehumanizing mathematics is also different from the humanistic mathematics movement of the 80s and 90s um, in that the rehumanizing mathematics is addressing the politics and the power dynamics and oppression that is happening in society. It's recognizing that mathematics has been a project that has supported um, white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. And that means that um, there are ways in which mathematics has continued to um, operate in ways that are very masculine, um, that are very universal. Um, and, and take away from what individual people feel and especially people who've been historically um, oppressed. It's, and the idea of rehumanizing is not just to stop with that, what's dehumanizing, that when we ask you that question, what's dehumanizing, we can stop there and we can say, wow, that feels awful for us to focus on that. But rehumanizing is to say, more than just wanting to, it to be decoupled from kind of economics and warfare and oppression and dehumanization, we want to actually couple with belonging and joy and other, other kinds of um, uh, concepts that, that Francis Sue um, has presented to us in terms of the mathematics for human flourishing. And um, I say rehumanizing mathematics is a verb because it, we don't, it's not an adjective. We could say rehumanized mathematics, that we're moving towards a rehumanized mathematics. But I say it's a verb because it's actually going to require from us constant vigilance and constant reframing and constant um, uh, asking of the very people that we say we're trying to rehumanize mathematics for, that they actually feel that it's rehumanizing. In other words, we alone, as, as math professors, as math teachers, as um, math coaches, we don't get to decide that our work is rehumanizing for other people, we need actually um, testimonials or, or um, documentation from the very people who say, you know what, this feels more meaningful for me. You know what, this feels more humane for me. You know what, this makes me feel like I belong to something and I want to be here. Um, and uh, I say we could rename it uh, decolonizing mathematics, um, but I don't take decolonizing as a, as a uh, metaphor or as a word that we would use lightly um, unless we're interrogating um, land sovereignty, mental sovereignty, recognizing the erasure of culture and language um, that has happened through boarding schools and other um, spaces in the United States and, and throughout North America, then I wouldn't necessarily use that frame. So these are the eight dimensions of rehumanizing mathematics. And I'll let you just look at them for a moment, and then I'll unpack what those mean. So when I move to presenter slide, now the slides that are there are tiny, and I can't read any of the text. So I'm going to have to continue to look back up at the slide behind me. OK, so here's the first four. We have across the top in blue, those are each one of the four, dimen uh, of any, uh, four dimensions. And actually, I, you know, I want to go back to one second. When I'm here, you, I, actually, this should be a 
3D kind of sphere. And there should be ways in which um, there's, you know, lines that are projecting between words and that this is very synergistic. This is also not suggesting that um, when I say rehumanizing that this is some kind of universal um, experience for everybody. Um, I'm talking about how do we center the experiences of people who um, have been historically oppressed, um, women, queer folk, people who are uh, uh, emergent bilinguals, um, and so when we look at this, we want to be thinking about what are all the ways in any one of these dimensions, what are, the way, what are the things that are the typical narrative in mathematics, and then what's the counter narrative that rehumanizing mathematics is actually creating. So let's, let's go back to these dimensions. Um, so in terms of positioning and participation, so what those rows mean is the first row is kind of generally what the thing is about. That's kind of just the content of, of the nature of it. The second thing is like, what would it look like if we were in a, cl in a classroom and we were looking for this kind of thing? And then the last thing is just, what's some literature that actually is related? Because this didn't just kind of come on from nowhere. Um, I'm building on the work of many other people and trying to bring it together. I think the thing for me that's useful about the, the circles and the framing is uh, that it becomes a mapping space for us. So I'm not trying to tell people how to rehumanize mathematics. I'm saying these are the dimensions we need to pay attention to and we need to map onto our practice and say, how am I doing with respect to positioning and participation? When do I address windows and mirrors? Um, do, I, do people leave my classroom or office hours or summer bridge programs feeling like mathematics is a living practice? What exactly would I see that would convince me of that or that would convince uh, students of that? So um, again, each, I'm looking at the time. Yeah, I have a moment. Um, so if we look at positioning and participation, again, that's just the status in classrooms. So that's the idea of like who gets credit for a problem. If somebody says something and then someone else says basically the same thing, does the instructor come back to the person and give credit to that person for what they said? Um, do we, um, are we? Are there opportunities for students to be authors in our classroom, to co-author the classroom with us? Um, or does it feel like this is kind of uh, a dictatorial experience and I don't really have any say because mathematics is kind of just the way it's being presented? So I say here that the authority shifts from the text or the teacher to other students and to students as meaning makers. And so oftentimes you might see, you know, a student who's raising their hand or waiting for you somehow to come over and to tell them that they're doing well and they're, or they're approaching their problem when there's people that are sitting around them. Um, and so that feels like the positioning and the participation is not a, rehumanize, a rehumanizing experience. And we can look through each one of these and look at how those are playing out. If you don't know things like ethnomathematics or funds of knowledge, uh, ethnomathematics has uh, been around since 1985. Ubi de Ambrosio has talked about the mathematics that are being practiced throughout the world and all of the mathematics that many times are not sanctioned by, by school, by institutions, by the West. Um, people in ethnomathematics also point out that math departments uh, in North America and through much of the West, that those people who, it's not an ethnomathematics as in there's cultures like, I think many people could think of, oh yeah, there's the Mayan vigesimal system, base 20, and oh yeah, there's, there's the, um, 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 the concept of zero that was created in India, or there's, but it's really recognizing that, uh, um, that Every culture has a culture of mathematics, so that means math departments at universities are also operating with an ethnomathematics. There's a particular mathematics that's being shared among people in terms of the culture, how we practice it, and what we do. And you can think about it from the point of view of your work too. Like, what are the what's the culture of of how somebody would represent and talk about number theory different from say topology, say from something else? So we're all operating with these kinds of cultures, and. Thinking about how, when does mathematics actually help us reconnect students with their own histories and their ancestors and roots. And again, not just thinking about it from the point of view of it being ancestral, as in pointing back that there were people a long time ago who did this, but who are the people today that are still doing this? Some people have been doing this through the work of um, having their students do auto, um, doing biographies on mathematicians after 1950, so that people recognize that it's not just the old dead people that we can point to. And again, you can look through, <laughs> you're pointing at who's in the audience. Uh, 
In terms of windows and mirrors, the reason that I like this term windows and mirrors instead of something like, um, it includes things like culturally relevant pedagogy. Some of you, how many of you heard of that word, culturally relevant pedagogy? So a whole bunch of people at the back. Wow, what does that mean? Uh, a whole bunch of people at the back and then some people up here in the front. Um, culturally relevant pedagogy or these kinds of social justice pedagogies or curriculum, oftentimes those to us sound like they signal there's something for other people but they're not something for everybody. So culturally relevant sounds like, oh yeah, that's for the black students or the Latinx students or for the, but it's not for, for everybody to be doing. So again, it, it, it windows and mirrors recognizes that we actually all need ways to see ourselves in the curriculum, that's the mirror, and ways to extend ourselves and to grow and to see a world that maybe is not necessarily us and that's the window. Um, and so asking ourselves, when are we providing windows and mirrors to students where that doesn't create the kind of um, binary that like this is for these people, this is for those people. Any given example could be both a window and a mirror. So I'll give you an example. If we think about a social justice mathematics um, uh, project, we might say, well, we would assign high school students the opportunity to think about the probability of you being harassed because you're standing on a corner near your high school and you're all black students. What's the likelihood of you being pulled over by the police because you're gathering there? Even when you can see across the street, there's three other groups of students who are gathering and nobody's bothering them, right? So you might use mathematics as an analytic tool to look into that situation and then prescribe, well, what should the school do differently through mathematics, right? So that thing we could think of as social justice mathematics but we can also frame it as, well, that very problem can feel like that is a mirror to a student of color who is constantly pulled over by police or is constantly harassed when they're gathering with friends because they look, um, they stand out. And, but that very experience of that for a student who's, who's maybe white and has never even thought about the fact that I stand on corners all the time and have never been hassled, that then for them becomes a window, right? So it, it moves us away from thinking about like there's those people and then there's us or there's some kind of like normal that is white and then there's everything else that's, that's compared to it. Uh, the living practice is uh, recognizing that you know we are currently working with a modern mathematics, a very young mathematics, and that there's uh, ways in which it is changing, and that we are um, breaking rules or adding new uh, postulates, and that's really changing what we what we're coming up with, and making that uh, visible to students. The other four dimensions are broadening mathematics, creation, body emotions, and ownership. And under broadening mathematics, um, we have, at least in the K-12 curriculum, and many of you probably feel like this is true at the college level curriculum as well, we have a very prescribed notion of what counts as mathematics. We give people this idea that there's this really strong focus on the kind of algebra to calculus um, pathway, and when we bring that even lower grade levels, we can say, well, that's a lot about um, numeracy, num num um, number sense, and not necessarily things like spatial reasoning or other kinds of mathematics that we could value. And under creation, uh, not just reproducing what has come before you, but thinking about like, well, how do, we, how, do we, how do we present to students an opportunity for them to create mathematics? So some of this comes from what maybe people know of as discovery mathematics or constructivist mathematics, where we might say, you're going to discover that pi is the relationship between the, uh, the radius and, and this, this object. But, uh, you're not necessarily, even in those experiments or in those um, ideas, maybe this is something that the students, that it, they're creating it and it's new for themselves, but it's not necessarily new to our field. But I'm saying like, how do we even get students to start thinking about things that would be new to our field? So in history, pointing out uh, the kinds of uh, ways that people have broken with rules, we might think of, okay, when students that are in elementary grade are presented with addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, those are four operations. What if we said to them, what if you came up with a fifth operation? What would that look like? Why would that be necessary? How could it be helpful? How could you be internally consistent in your system? When would it stop being useful? Those kinds of exercises, I think, get us to the point where I think many of you know that when you're in higher levels of mathematics, you're not just following what other people have been giving you, but you're constantly thinking about, what if I, ch what if I started with this conjecture? What if I did, w ignored this postulate? What if I added this postulate? What if I, so again, thinking about where can we get that kind of creation to come into play? 
body and emotions is really recognizing that for many, many students, the idea of mathematics is that it's really about a brain and then some kind of form of representing. So whether that's you know paper pencil or whether that's a calculator or that's a computer, it's never really asking, do I need my body, my full body, my senses, my, uh, my physical um, body to do mathematics? And so thinking about when can we actually invite the senses into the classroom, when can we invite, invite the body, when can we invite students to not be able to do math problems unless we literally have another body. And so that might mean that we need like walking scale geometry problems or we might need graph theory problems where you actually are on the graph and you are part of the problem. Uh, in terms of ownership, uh, again, recognizing that mathematics can be something that is not just something that other people give you, but that it's something that you would do for yourself, that you would want to do because it's joyful, because it's playful, because it's a form of expression for you. So again, where are we looking for opportunities to do that in our, um, in our spaces? So I'm bringing you back here to the eight dimensions and giving you a second to look at that. Oh, okay. So we're going to skip this. We were going to ask you what we thought in terms, which of those, so maybe you're just processing this in the back of your head. Maybe you're writing it down on a note card um, if you had a question for us and we're moving on. I can't see what the slide's saying. Oh, okay. so, what do, so what have we been doing for this week that we've been here? We, we still have 25 more minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so what have we been doing? We have been taking that framework and we've been taking that framework and we've been saying um, when we have guest presenters, so we have had mathematicians who have either Zoomed in with us or who physically come and presented how they're taking a course and they're take, have their students are all creating a wiki and they're actually writing the textbook for the course or they, that somebody has radically changed their assessments and how they're using group exams and how they're having students reflect on their emotions as they're taking exams and things like that. We've had all different kinds of presenters for us and we've been analyzing what they present to us through this frame and then we've been thinking about our own action project so everybody that's in the group is presenting it came with an idea of I want to go do something when I go back home and then thinking okay well how do these how do these dimensions relate to it hello everybody um I'm just going to talk a little bit about my journey. Um, my name is Mario Myers. Um, I'm an associate professor of mathematics education at Kennesaw State, um, just north of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and so I've been thinking about these issues for quite some time. Um, and I remember when I first came into the profession and I was, you know, really kind of gung-ho about culturally relevant pedagogy and I felt like, you know, that's not really working for me. Um, and I started really thinking about equity, and I was like, oh, this isn't really working for me, and I kept having to have these debates about equity versus equality, and why aren't those things the same, and I just felt like it wasn't getting me the mileage um, that I wanted. And so then when I started thinking about what does it mean to rehumanize mathematics, that seemed like it gave me a framework to really think about structuring my course. Um, so much of what I do is to prepare elementary mathematics teachers, um, yay! So excited to have elementary um, people in the room with me, or that love elementary mathematics. And so, 